Hello and welcome to the B-Roll. I am your host, Jason A. Ration, and here on the B-Roll, we like to put a uh, spotlight on independent cinema. And I say that wearing a Marvel bow tie and pocket square. Thank you, Barbara. Um, <laughs> but that's because my guest today is a Marvel in her own right. <laughs> and she is my friend, Michelle Mower. She is an um, uh, award-winning, I'm gonna read it off here, award-winning writer, producer, and director. Uh, film credits include uh, The Preacher's Daughter, The Preacher's Mistress, and The Preacher's Sin, and the upcoming Never List. Uh, she currently serves on the board of Southwest Alternate Media Project, Swamp, with me. But wait, there's more. She <laughs> also is the CEO of Imagination Worldwide. It's a sales and distribution company that has released both films and documentaries like Rock the 36, mm -hmm. Painted Black, The Light of the Moon, and Wild Nights with Emily. And so we have a lot to talk about. Michelle, welcome to the B-Roll. Well, thank you for having me. So what started you on your journey to be a filmmaker? Well, I think I had an early interest just in the creative, uh, you know, I had a very creative mind uh, early on. Uh, when I was a kid, I would, um, you know, write little plays and make puppets and do puppet plays and, you know, so I think that performance, uh, you know, characteristic was always there, you know, being interested in storytelling, being interested in the performing arts. Um, but as I grew older, I developed uh, more in, you know, sort of veered more in the path of a writer and uh, in discover screenwriting somewhere around middle school, I think. And, and once I discovered that movies, which I loved going to the movies, were actually written, <laughs> then that was pretty much, you know, that's, you know, that was it. That's what I was going to be. I was going to write movies. And, uh, and then, of course, went to college. And in college, you can't just study screenwriting. You have to study the whole filmmaking process, right, as you should. And so once I was in college and got behind a camera, then I fell in love with that side of the, you know, of the storytelling process. So, um, you know, directing and, and, uh, and then for me, the producing sort of is a, you know, um, I mean, I enjoy doing it. I can do it. I'm actually very good at it. Um, but to me, it's sort of the means to the end to be able to get my, you know, to write and direct the, and tell the stories that I want to tell. So you started off making short films, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, <clears throat> when I was in college, we would make, uh, you know, student, sh student short films, experimental films, uh, you know, some narrative stories. I did an experimental film that was based off of, uh, of a poem called Porphyria's Lover. Um, and, and then, you know, just tr sort of trying to develop your craft. And, and really that's what I saw in those early years short filmmaking being is a, a means of, of developing my craft as a storyteller, developing my craft as a director, writer, and so forth. And, and it was really great um, that I was given the opportunity to get to, to you know, study filmmaking here in Houston and, uh, you know, get my hands on, you know, the equipment that I needed to, to, uh, to be able to do that. And, um, I, you know, back then there wasn't a lot of access to, to film equipment. And um, so you pretty much had to go to college or go to a school that, you know, that had the equipment um, or be involved with organizations like Swamp, which you mentioned earlier. And so, uh, so I did all of that, you know, I, every opportunity I could to get, you know, my hands on a camera and go tell a story I did. And short filming making was certainly a way um, early on to sort of hone my craft and really develop myself as a, um, as a you know, filmmaker and storyteller. Well, we mentioned Swamp and uh, we both serve on the board of it, but mm -hmm. you actually used to be an employee of Swamp. That is correct. How did that come about? <laughs> Well, um, I had been, uh, right out of college, I was hired at Channel 2, um, and I was a PA initially, but within five weeks, they promoted me to uh, associate producer, but it was of the morning show. And that meant I went in at 11 o'clock at night, and I didn't get off until 9 o'clock in the morning, and uh, which was fine, except for I had small children at the time, and it was really difficult to you know, work those hours and then have the energy to be a mom to small children. And so that job lasted about a year and then I just burned out, <laughs> quite frankly. And, um, but I still loved being on the set. I loved being able to write and see what I, what I wrote on television. It was really cool, you know, as an associate producer, that's what I did, I wrote the news. And that was just a really cool experience and I loved it. And um, it's just, you know, the hours were just not conducive to where I was in my life at that point. So uh, I f figured out another way to be able to, to stay in the industry through subsequent jobs. I, I um, started a video production business uh, since I had the editing gear and the cameras and all of that. Um, then I, it was, you know, we shoot weddings and 
what pretty much whatever anyone would hire me to shoot, uh, and um, and then was able to you know even beyond that uh, get involved with some local film organizations like Swamp and um, and I was a member for uh, well since college and an opening came up uh, at the uh, organization and Casey Kelly who was not an employee of, of Swamp she but she did office out of the Swamp house mm-hmm. you know the little old house on on West Main um, and uh, and so she re- recommended me for the position of program coordinator and I was hired and I you know it was a life-changing um, position you know being being given that opportunity because my job literally was to program independent film screenings um, workshops for independent filmmakers um, monthly networking salons, you know, all the different things that at that time nobody was doing. We didn't have Facebook back then. We didn't have Twitter and social media that would allow people to commune online and, you know, sort of find other filmmakers in their community. The only way you could meet and network with local filmmakers was through Swamp or through Women in Film and Television and local film organizations. So it put me sort of in a very central role in the independent film community, here in Houston, and and I loved it. it. You know, I was able to, you know, as a you know up and coming filmmaker, literally the best job you can have, <laughs> because you're programming programming workshops uh, that teach you what you need to learn to to make films. Right, you're programming independent film screenings, and you're meeting independent filmmakers who, you know, are doing incredible work, and you're learning from them, and you're becoming friends with them. You know, so it really was a, a incredible opportunity, and. Um, and uh, you know, I I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Swamp, quite frankly. So um, so that's you know that was a a big part of my growth as a, as an independent filmmaker. But in 2010, I had written a screenplay uh, that was you know it was inspired. It's not a it's not based on my life story. Uh, I make try to get that very clear with people. <laughs> uh, it, but it is inspired by my experience as a minister's daughter, and uh, it's called the preacher's daughter, and um, I, you know, I wrote the screenplay and and workshopped it through Swamp, through doing, um, uh, you know, roundtable readings and and even submitted it to like Austin Film Festival's screenwriting competition where it was a second rounder, and so I did because of my work with Swamp, I uh, I knew the channels that I could that I the opportunities that I had to really develop my screenplay and make it as good as it possibly could be before I shot anything Mm -hmm. you know before we we went into production and I did all of that and I made sure that script was as good as it was possibly could be you know going into production and because of my work within the community I had a lot of people here in Houston who were willing to help me out because they saw the work that I was doing um, trying to build the the independent film industry here in Houston through my work with Swamp and so a lot of people wanted to support me in my first feature film so Houston really was you know I could. I don't know if I could have done this movie anywhere else, but here, um, through this experience that I had. You know, this. Ex, you know, being, you know, so in, embedded in the local film industry and um, and the community, and being able to, to um, you know, get people who are willing to, you know, to help me out. So, um, and working with Houston Community College was also really important. Um, I was teaching there, and they were able. I was able to. Um, you know, to utilize some of their equipment, and and their students came and supported. You know, the org- supported the film and got some uh, on-set teaching experience, <laughs> shall we say? So it was really a community effort getting that first movie made here in Houston, and um, and it certainly paid off. <laughs> yes, it has, and and I have benefited a lot from Swamp and the stuff you program, especially the uh, Business of Film Conference, which mm-hmm. is now the Business of Film Series. Right. Can do on. And one thing. Um, I'd heard I'd heard the saying that it's a business, not an art, filmmaking, and it really sort of is a business. And there's a lot of things you talked about the whole pre-production of getting the script read, table reads, getting feedback, mm-hmm. rewriting, and stuff like that coverage. And I think that I have benefited a lot of that because, especially now that has changed so much, a lot of your work is in the pre-production about post-production mm-hmm. and distribution because you can't just take it to Sundance and Cannes and think someone's going to just write you a big check and take your movie and it's going to be all you know cameras and red carpet (laughs) and stuff like that and it has changed and the business has changed and you have to so I have benefited a lot from that Uh, what are some of your proudest moments being at Swamp? Working for Swamp? Uh, I would definitely say the business of film was was uh, one of my 
you know biggest contributions uh, in my work with Swamp. Uh, I I don't believe that the that filmmaking is is all business and not art. I mean I think that. The, the filmmaking is not just a singular art form, it's actually a combination of art forms that come together to create this visual story, right? You have makeup artists who, you know, they're artists and they have a discipline mm -hmm. that is, you know, you have directors, you have screenwriters, each of these are art forms um, that all sort of come together to to tell the story, right? Cinematography is not form. So, so I would say it's multiple artistic disciplines. Um, but what really brings it together and helps it get out into the world is the business side. And I understood that as a filmmaker, that if I wanted to make a film, um, I needed to really understand the business side of the industry, right? And, um, and so I started this conference uh, back in, I guess it was in 2003. <laughs> and it ran, you know, it ran um, annually. It was, a annual, it was like a weekend conference, a Friday and Saturday weekend conference at Rice University. And uh, I was really proud of that. We brought in some incredible speakers during that time, such as Ted Hope, mm -hmm. who is now the um, head of production at Amazon Studios, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, Lonnie Ramadi, who's the vice president, head of business affairs for New Image Millennium Films. Um, some, you know, some real power players. And uh, Swamp was able to bring these these speakers in, uh, and you know, and the local community could learn from these and network with these these individuals, right? Um, that's what it was about. Uh, but while networking and meeting these individuals, also learning how to not just tell a story, but how to tell a story that will be able to sell mm -hmm. in the marketplace, right? right? And I gotta be honest with you, it's harder now to sell movies than ever before. Yes. The, the number of movies that are being made, uh, there's just an oversaturation of content in the marketplace. So every indie film is kind of a needle in a haystack. So having a, under, having a really strong grasp and understanding of the business side of the industry will make it less of a needle in that haystack, right? Because mm -hmm. you know how to to connect the dots to get, get this film out into the world. You know, you know who to, um, say, hire as a PR firm. You know, you know who's, who has a track record with getting these indie films out into the you know the public space, getting into pe the public's consciousness, right? Um, and you know, so those those are the kinds of things that we that we you know focused on on the in the conference. Um, and then the rest of the year, we focused on the art form, you know, which helped develop the storytellers, just like I was developed, you know, through my work with Swamp. So, you know, I think it's 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 a double you know double edged um, you know sword that you really have to you have to you know make sure that you're paying attention to both. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> Let's put it that way, or you'll end up cut like me. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> yes. Uh, well, you know, it's, it is, it, like you said, it is business. And also, you talked earlier, it is about a community of people Absolutely. from different backgrounds coming together to help tell a story. That's and right. that's one thing I love about the, the filmmaking Absolutely. process. So, And that's kind of what go, goes into making your first film, The Preacher's Daughter, uh -huh. and, which was shot here in Houston and a mm -hmm. little bit uh, outside of Houston. Mm -hmm. What were some things you learned? Because you had done short films, so you kind of knew the craft, but what were some things you learned while doing a feature film? Uh, <laughs> I learned a lot on Preacher's Daughter. I, I jokingly tell people this was my master's degree. You know, instead of going to school and getting a master's degree in film, I just used the money to make a film. And, uh, and it really was a um, very eye-opening experience. And despite all the workshops and all of the, you know, networking and talking to other filmmakers and trying to figure out how to make a low budget, high quality film, uh, you're just never truly prepared. <laughs> you never truly know what you're getting into until you're in it. And and you have to think of filmmaking as a machine, right? Like I said, we have all these different parts, these different departments, uh, all kind of working together towards the same end, but they have to do it in a very like seamless t way because you have just so much time. Right, you have to get so much shot in a day, or you get behind, and when you get behind, you lose money. Right, and uh, if any one of those areas are weak, and it's holding, it holds back everybody. Right, so that's really the biggest thing that I learned was making sure to hire the right people, because uh, when you try to cut corners, especially financially, <laughs> you don't always get the best of the best. You don't get people who are, who are, you know, really um, experienced enough to to keep that machine going, if that makes sense. 
And so that was a that was a big part of it. And and uh, you know I'm not trying to spare to say that you know, I had a lot of incredible crew people on this film. Right. Don't get me wrong. I had some of the cream of the crop of here in Houston, but you know there were others who were on the film who were not as experienced. Mm-hmm. And and they did hold us back. And we got behind. And and you know it cost us money in the end. And so what I learned um, what I learned on that film was you get what you pay for. Mm-hmm. Right, <laughs> and uh, and that's always true. And I think that I think that um, at least in filmmaking, in my experience, uh, so it really taught me to make sure that you know even when you're lo- working in a low budget, to be very mindful about who you're hiring, and and find out from other people who've worked for, for them to make sure that they're going to be a right fit for your production. Or like I said, go make some short films, hire people to work on your short films. And if you like working with them, and you think they're good hard workers and they can do the job, then you bring them onto your feature. Right. All right. Um, and uh, it's really a great way to sort of get to know who's in town and figure out who's, you know, good to work with and who's not good to work with. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, and then once the film was completed, it mm-hmm. was time to get it out in the world. And how did you go about doing that? <clears throat> well, it's interesting. Uh, we go back to Swamp and the business of film. <laughs> it's a it's a really interesting story because. All of these things that I did over the course of my life all came into play in a very like tangible way uh, when it came to to releasing this film. Um, I say you know it's good to understand the business side because then you can plan. Well, I honestly hadn't planned like I thought I had. You know, I, in my mind, I was going to make this little no budget film, low budget film, submit it to a film festival, hopefully get into a you know a reputable film festival you get my a premiere there and maybe get picked up by a distributor but honestly I was I was being very realistic in my mind thinking you know I'd be happy I'd be lucky if I got on iTunes you know because I understood going to these business film conferences that you know the market's tough right it's mm-hmm. tough to get distribution and so I had to make I had to before even making the film I had to come to terms with that and say you know what even if I lose money, you know, largely I, it was my investment, investment of, um, you know, some of my family members um, and who were really investing to support me, you know. And I had to come to grips with the idea that I very likely will lose money on this film, but I have to tell the story. I just have to tell the story. Right. And even if it ends up just, you know, on iTunes, I'll be happy. Right. Well, what ended up happening was we f- we finished the film, and it took us a year to get through post production because of because financially we just didn't have the money to. Yeah, that's to, the, yeah, one of so, the hardest parts. You, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I'd have to raise money, you know. Then we get back into post production, and then until we you know ran out of money, and then we'd stop, and then I'd go raise some more money, and you know kind of went like that uh, for a year. And so a year after we wrapped, uh, the film was finished, and a friend of mine who uh, I met through the Business of Film Conference. Uh, she came in and was a speaker um, uh, at the conference. Her name is Orla Ravid. And she had just founded an organization in Los Angeles called the Film Collaborative. And one of the things that the Film Collaborative is a nonprofit organization um, that, that sort of helps filmmakers navigate the world of distribution. And one of the things that they offer filmmakers is an opportunity to review the film and give you some feedback on what type of Film, which film festivals you should be targeting, what uh, distributors you should be targeting, that kind of thing. And so I sent the film to Orly, and she watched it, and we had lunch in L.A., and uh, or maybe it was brunch in L.A., it was brunch. And I remember very spe- specifically her saying, don't bother submitting this to film festivals, it won't get in, it's too commercial. And I had no idea what that meant. You know, the film festivals are looking for, you know, um, you know, very artsy, mm-hmm. you know, indie type of storytelling. And mine was very television. It, it felt very television. And, and it's true, it did. And so um, and all my lead actors were all from television. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, so she was correct. It was very te- felt very television. Uh, I had no idea how to get my film or that I could get my film to television. And so in the course of the conversation, I said, well, if it's television, how, you know, how can I get it to maybe some of the cable networks. And uh, she said, well, you could take it to a market like AFM or, uh, well, it was this is in November and AFM had just happened and I wasn't gonna wait a whole other year. And AFM's the American film market. The American film market, right. And I wasn't gonna wait a whole year to you know, take it to AFM. So uh, so she said, well, I know a sales company in, in Los Angeles and they do a lot of sales to Lifetime. And I think this film could p- potentially be a good fit for Lifetime. 
And boy, was she correct, because we sent the film to, to this was like middle of November, we sent the film to this company, uh, Orly sent it to, uh, on my behalf, because she knew the, the um, sales rep there, Larry Gable, who I didn't know at the time. And uh, she shot him an email. He said, send me the film. We sent him the film. And uh, it took about a month, but they watched the film. And I'm in New York, you know, enjoying a nice weekend in New York with my kids, you know, for the holidays. And I get a call. We're on the way back to the airport. I get a call, and it's this, you know, uh, Canadian Frenchman, very loud Canadian <laughs> Frenchman, <laughs> on the phone telling me, you know, named Pierre David, telling me how wonderful my film is and how much she, you know, thinks it's perfect for them. And they wanted to, you know, take on the rights and try to sell it to Lifetime. And, you know, and, you know, he... You know, he's a good salesman, that Pierre. He's he's a, one of the best. So, uh, you know, he, you know, we went through the whole negotiations. He signed the film in January. And uh, and and then Larry Gable, who worked with Pierre at the time, I mean, he's worked with Pierre at the company, uh, was, you know, part of that conversation as well. And in February, I get, I, I'm here in Houston and I get a call from Larry and he says, well, you know, are you sitting down? <laughs> and I said, oh, no, let me sit down. He goes, okay, we've sold it to Lifetime. And then when he told me how much they were paying, it was enough to cover all the, my, my expenses, my investors' expenses. It was just like, it was amazing. And, and so the film was uh, acquired by Lifetime. We did have some technical issues that we had to deal with to get it, you know, broadcast ready. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, going back to that, you get what you pay for scenario. <laughs> But, uh, but we were able to overcome those technical issues, and the film premiered in August of 2012, and it was the highest rated movie on Lifetime Movie Network for the mm -hmm. entire year. Yes. Not of all time. A lot right. of people say that. That's not true. Okay. But for the entire year. For the year. And it was, it was successful enough to where Lifetime came back and said, we want another Preacher film, right? So now I'm writing, you know, another movie. And, uh, and I brought on a, a co-writer, a uh, um, uh, local actor here in Houston who's... Um, who's a very talented writer as well, and he and I together wrote the screenplay for, the working title was The Preacher's Mistress. They've now changed the title to A Woman Betrayed, but uh, it aired on Lifetime as The Preacher's Mistress. And so we shot that here in Houston as well, so that was exciting. I uh, had a better budget, not, you know, not a huge budget, but a better budget. And uh, we were able to bring in some really great actors, and, um, and we filmed all over the city. We filmed at the Water Wall, we filmed at, um, the icon uh, hotel icon, which was, uh, you know, in their in their penthouse, got a beautiful scene on the balcony there. Um, so Houston's very prominently. Yes, I, that's where I loved, in, I loved it because it, it's right? like a high right rail, really, for Houston. So it really I really was. I like that. So thank you for shooting that here. Of course, of course. So I, that's what I wanted to do with that film. I said, you know, I want to really show Houston in this film and really show like what we, you know, of course we had the traffic scene as well. We yes. have the suburbs. Yes. We have, you know, kind of like what you think of, you know, those of us who live here in Houston, you know, sort of the, you know, everyday uh, locations that we go to. But, uh, but we were also able to show off some fun locations here in town as well as in Preacher's Daughter as well. When the, the opening scene in Preacher's Daughter, at least the one that aired on Lifetime, <laughs> was, uh, you know, our lead actress walking down Westheimer. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, and all of those little shops, you know, yes. right along Westheimer. So, so I think you know. And then we also filmed on Nineteenth Street in the Heights. So we were able to, you know, aesthetically get some interesting, diverse locations for that film as well. And um, and uh, here in Houston, and it, that's what's so amazing about filming in Houston is that you you have everything. Like like ba backdrop wise, you know, you have the suburbs, you have coastal, you know, down in Galveston, you have you know small town. You know, with small towns all around Houston, right? You've got city, you know, futuristic city. You know, you, pretty much any kind of setting you need, you can get right here in Houston. And and what Lifetime liked about Houston, especially with that second film, was, you know, back in the, you know, in the mid, you know, like 2013, if you watched Lifetime, a lot of their films felt like they were filmed in the 90s. They felt kind of dated because they were. <laughs> and Lifetime was very focused on everything looking very new and contemporary mm -hmm. and present day, right. right? And and Houston's the perfect backdrop for that. It's very, you know, a lot of our buildings are newer. It's very shiny city, you know, uh, very contemporary city. And so uh, so that's why you see a lot of those those types of locations in, in the second film. 
even more so than in the first film, which was largely set in the country and uh, filmed, um, incidentally, at the house I grew up in in Lake City. So, oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so it's, it's um, you know, it, that's what I love about Houston. It's just it's very diverse, not just population-wise, but also location-wise. Well, and then you, uh, was, uh, that was a quick turnaround, too. What was that like, sort quick. of being, I would say, under the gun, but it was, it, like, Preacher, right. like, you spent a couple of years, because, like, post-production, and this is like, okay, give us a movie now. So what was it like? <laughs> well, having... it helps when you have money. Let's just say that. When you have the money to do it, not that we had huge budget, but we had a significantly higher budget than I did with my first film. So if you have the money and you can hire the right people and uh, who know what they're doing and get it done very quickly, then you know that's the way to go. Uh, but that said, it was still a very, it was a challenge getting it because we shot it in, I think in like May, and we had to have it delivered by September, which is a crazy turnaround. Well, May's crazy. always the perfect time to shoot in Houston because the yeah. weather's so nice. Right. Yeah. So. so we had by the end of September to deliver <laughs> it because they aired it in November. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. And then of course shooting in the summer in Houston is oh so fun. Yeah. But uh, but you know we we you know we made it work we, we made it happen and uh and i'm really you know uh i would say say the preacher's mistress of of the three is probably the most houston centric and and um and um you know it was my first film where i was you know given a chance just to you know to direct a feature film that that or a television movie um, that I didn't have to go out and raise the money for. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was, and you didn't and, have to worry about the distribution because right. you know this is it's going to be on Lifetime. I don't have to exactly. worry about that part. So exactly. the two the two most the two hardest things raising yeah. money and getting distribution were taken care of. Right. So th so because of that there was, it, in some ways less of a stress level, um, but in other way but it added stress in other ways. You know because now you're delivering a product, now you're delivering something that that other people are. You know, they're looking for very specific things. So you are, you know, with my first film, I had total c creative control. That was not the case with the second movie or the third one. So, uh, so you're, add sort of a different level of, of um, you know, n you know, stress to the process. But, uh, but I had a really great team. Um, Pierre was uh, my executive producer. The, the Canadian Frenchman was my executive producer on my second and third films. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he demands a, you know, he demands, um, you know, excellence mm -hmm. in, in all aspects of the process. And, and I could not ask for a better, you know, person to, to sort of help me go from low budget indie filmmaker to professional industry filmmaker. And, uh, because he, he, you know, he made us, you know, made us, uh, better, he made us better storytellers. Hello, thank you for enjoying my conversation part one with my friend Michelle Moore talking about her journey as a filmmaker. Catch part two this Wednesday and Sunday, 7.30 a.m. and p.m. right here on HTV. Don't want to miss it. What to my amaze is how many people don't know about HTV who are filmmakers here in Houston. If you are, I would highly recommend going, uh, checking them out. You can go to htvhouston.net and you can get a free tour of this facility. Um, always keep your hands on top of your head because your mind will be blown when taking a tour of this facility. So, and I am very, very grateful to HTV for having us here at this facility. It's great. Uh, there's a green screen behind me. I'm sure the background is probably something like a bow tie because <laughs> bow ties are awesome. But uh, you, they have really great uh, editing software and sound stages and all amazing things. So definitely uh, check out HTV.
And again, so happy that the both that uh, the B roll is here. Thank you.